I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the window. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. You're in our field with you now. That's one small step for man. Hello and welcome to Space, here from the city of Montreal in Canada, a place that's well known for culture and music, but is also home to the teams that control the robots that built the International Space Station and the people who are developing rovers for the Moon and Mars. We met them to find out how they overcome the unique challenges of using robots in space. Robots are an essential companion to mankind in space, unique tools that make it possible to live and work in orbit. And one of the hardest working space robots is the Canadarm2 on the International Space Station. Its masters are to be found in Montreal at the Canadian Space Agency. These are the people who build and control the space robots and train others to use them. From his control room, operations engineer Mathieu Caron can steer the Canadarm2 directly or instruct astronauts in space. In a few months, we'll be using the Canadarm2 to catch a Dragon resupply capsule. That capsule cannot dock on its own with the space station. It matches the heading and the speed of the space station, comes within 10 meters of the station, and astronauts inside will use the Canadarm2 to grab on the SpaceX capsule. They have to, to make sure that they grab on quickly Otherwise, you know, a small perturbation will cause the vehicle to, to diverge quite rapidly. Canada, which has partnered with the European Space Agency since the 1970s, launched its first Canadarm space robot on the American shuttle back in 1981. <laughs> It was a request from NASA to build an arm for the space shuttle, which was then designed and built in Canada. Then, from then on, each shuttle had its space arm, which was used for most of their missions. Afterwards, when it was time to design the ISS, Canada proposed making a new arm, the Canadarm2, for the space station. That arm and Dexter, the mobile servicing robot, are a lasting source of satisfaction for the country. Canada built the Canadarm2, and Canadarm2 built this space station. Everybody should be proud of that. Each and every ESA and NASA astronaut has to train on Canadian space robotics. It begins with a scale model of the ISS and a lesson from engineer Kamudu Jinadasa. What we do here in this location at the model is we have the astronauts come and they actually use these models, configure them, you can move them around, and they'll configure each of the joints, roll, yaw, pitch, and they'll put it in the initial configuration for their operation and they'll actually put it on the station and go through uh, motion of the arm to the operation that they're gonna do. It's important because we don't want any collisions in space, either collisions, self-collisions between uh, the robotics themselves, self-collisions uh, between the joints, collisions with EVA, that would be catastrophic, or even collisions with the station, which could cause a rapid depress, and then we'd be in a, a really high emergency situation. While the daily operations of Canadarm continue, CSA engineers are also working on robot rovers for the Moon and Mars. 
This is a rover that we've just designed with a Canadian company. So the aim is to see if we can send rovers for planetary exploration. So we're aiming for the Moon and Mars. So you have to find wheels that can adapt and resist the cold. It can be minus 150, minus 200 degrees. So rubber wheels don't work. You have to be able to adapt to obstacles and be really tough. The long-term vision is that such rovers would be mounted with drills and prospection devices to search for useful resources that could help mankind survive in space. If we were able to find water on the moon, that would allow us to use the moon as a base, make fuel, make oxygen. So if we had water and we've shown that there are traces of it there, then the next step is to show if we're capable of extracting water and be able to do something with it with sufficient quantities. So that's a type of mission that we could do that would then allow us to pursue lunar exploration. The history of space robotics has been one of man and machine working hand in hand. But the future is likely to be one of autonomy, as robots work remotely, saving astronauts from hazardous tasks. Whenever something can be done robotically, we're asked to do so. I'm talking about uh, cutting or moving uh, thermal blankets, unscrewing caps, uh, cutting tethers, and even bringing a nozzle and pumping fuel in the, in the satellite. And that really represents a, a, a promising avenue for, for robotics in the future. Longer term, Canada and the other ISS partners are looking beyond near-Earth orbit to a station deeper in space. The next step will be to go further. We talk about a cislunar station in the space between the Earth and the Moon. And there, again, if we construct a space station habitat in that area, it's sure that we're going to need space robotics. Away from robots now and to our regular update on the ExoMars mission. The spacecraft is on its way to the red planet right now. When it gets there, it's going to be looking for methane, a gas that's linked to life, but could be coming from other sources too. Let's find out more in Destination Mars. Hello. My name's Nick Thomas. I'm the principal investigator of the Cassis instrument, the high-resolution camera on the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. Cassis is designed to look at dynamic processes on the surface of Mars. And so we'll be looking at things that, that are happening, uh, that, the changes that are occurring on the surface. There are volcanic mechanisms that can produce methane and it's got very little to do with life in that particular case that we know that there are meteorite impacts on the surface of Mars. This exposes fresh material from under the surface and that fresh material could be containing some trace gas material like methane for example. We also have evidence for avalanches and, uh, and levines. There might be gas trapped there, it's then exposed, gets into the atmosphere and who knows, maybe it's detectable with uh, the TGO's instruments. The production of methane is not necessarily uh, to do with life. It's, uh, there are other processes that can produce methane. So looking for life is not, not trivial, and uh, proving that it's there is it's very difficult. That's all from us here in Montreal. You can keep up to date with Space News and watch other episodes of Destination Mars on Euronews.com. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the window. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. You're going to have to deal with you now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap.